going on, everybody? And thanks for coming back. Uh, today, I'm excited to have Gareth Hanrahan with me. Uh, Gareth, how's it going? Hey, how are you? <sighs> Making it. <laughs> I'm gonna Making fun. Yeah, yeah. Ma making it amongst the trove of books and work and having a 10 month old, you know, it's it's never a dull day. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, know, I know we talked a little bit off camera about, uh, you know, you, you clearly have experience with children because you've got three. And I'm, I know the last time we spoke was back when I really was just podcasting a little bit and I didn't even have a kid. So now, <laughs> now life's completely turned around. Did I recommend the baby owner's manual to you? You did. You did. And it was, it was very, it was very handy. <laughs> I feel like I need to get everybody a copy. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, it, yeah. So, so any, anybody that's expecting or is planning on having children in the future, the baby owner's manual is, uh, is perfect yeah. reading. Uh, especially if you have limited to zero experience with younger siblings. <laughs> well, you can unplug a printer because that's like, you know, the yes. same way. Exactly. So um, I kind of want to uh, just start out like I normally do. Uh, just tell everybody a little bit about yourself and uh, kind of how you got into writing and, you know, how you got to where you are today. Oh, okay. Um Yeah, I started like writing really back in college, doing tabletop role playing supplements and adventures for those. And that sort of began into doing some sort of freelance writing on the side for tabletop role playing companies. And then the real world grown-up job I had went away, and I went, sure, I'll, I'll see how long I can keep this freelance writing going. And turned out you can keep freelancing and gaming for quite a long time if you're very lucky. So I've been doing that full time since 2003 ish, um, which is, oh dear God, that's nearly 20 years. Ah! <laughs> Where did those years ago? <laughs> Um, so yeah, my, my sort of like quote unquote day job is writing D&D-esque supplements for various games. And then a few years ago, I um, did a sort of tie-in novel for the Paranoia role-playing game. And after that, I said, I'll, I'll, I'll try doing like, you know, a, an original novel and wrote it uh, at various early, early mornings between freelance gigs. And then that sold and now I'm doing novels too, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> right. the last 20 years in that show. <laughs> so so when you say uh supplements what do you mean as far as uh the tabletop games go oh uh like adventures mainly um setting guides rule books bits of everything um like for example one of the big things i did a few years ago was the dracula dossier which is basically a rewrite of dracula as a spy novel so basically we took the text of dracula added lots of added stuff and marginalia from like generations of British spies. And then came up with this like your know, giant adventure based around that where basically Dracula is real and you're hunting him in the modern day as like, you know, Jason Bourne-esque spies. And you use Dracula as the text to go, to go through to find all these clues to like to various locations and uncover the secret history of Dracula and his machinations. Interesting. Huh. See, uh, I didn't. I didn't really like grow up like in tabletop gaming. I don't really do a whole lot of tabletop gaming because I also don't have a lot of friends that read. So like I'm just like surrounded by I guess like smart, not nerdy people. <laughs> so 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 I'm I'm like clearly new to like all the tabletop stuff and mm -hmm. and and you know watching the D and D uh, panel during TBR Con in January was like my first experience like seeing how D D is played yeah. granted it's it's different because it's not in person you know it's, yeah. it's all virtual but um tell me i guess tell me a little bit about i guess like what goes into into tabletop gaming you know you can be as specific as possible with like if you want to go like dungeons and dragons mm -hmm. or if you want to go pathfinder or whatever um because i because i'm curious like how how do you come up with the storyline for it you know do you do you base it off other stories that you've done before or do you do you actually come up with your own original games like you did with with tbr con oh it, it depends i mean the uh, first thing i i draw a distinction between doing it as a job which i do where like you know i write stuff for publication and your home games because as it's pointed out there's role playing is a bizarre hobby in that like people don't like sort of not everyone who like you know, reads, reads a novel goes, oh, I'll write a novel. Not everyone who watches a Mar Marvel movie goes, oh, I'll go home and like, film my own movie. 
But <laughs> role playing games, by their very nature, they, they expect the the, like, the audience to, or the the, the 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 participants to be creative on that level. Because like, you know, when you buy a role playing game, what you're getting is a set of rules for like adjudicating the situations that happen in the story, but they don't give you the adventure. But you have to cope with that yourself, or like, I mean, even if you take a, like, a published adventure that I that like, I or someone else has written, that's basically just like a like sort of a script with like you know suggestions and like you know here's like the opening scene, here's what might happen next, here are possible things that happen down the road, but the GM still has to like work all those into the game, work out how, how you sort of build the connections and build on the material. It's much more sort of like a a sort of collaboration between writer and games master. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, the basic concept is games master describes what's going on, players say what they do. It's like an ongoing conversation describing a, an evolving story with dice. I gotcha. Because it's almost because it's almost like you know you're playing a game, but you're also you're also it's like narrating a story at the same time because yeah, so, you're you're coming up with it as you go. Yeah. You're narrating it, you're generating it. There's, there's a huge debate in role playing games over like you know. Where the story actually happens, what constitutes a story? Like, do, is the story the thing that's like you know, that's like the GM plans beforehand and the players play through it, or is it what happened? What like you know, what's discovered afterwards? Is a like discovering in play concept where no one knows what exactly is going to happen because of like the dice and the random decisions of the, of the players and so forth. And that's one reason why I love it. It, it is this like you know, every every game session is different, and even when people are playing the same venture, they'll go through it in different ways. Mm -hmm. Like I started out writing games for conventions, where you'd have like you know six tables all playing the same like three-hour adventure, and then you meet up afterwards, and each table had a totally different experience. They go like, "Oh, like yo, what did you guys do when you got to the inn? Oh, we burnt it down. You burnt it down. Like you know, we like you know met the innkeeper. It was great. He was a great guy. We loved him. We killed the innkeeper." <laughs> I gotcha. Yeah, because yeah, I, I feel like it'd be something that I'd really enjoy, you know, if if I had the the party to do it with. <laughs> but, like, I just I have like no nerdy friends that are around. I, I feel like that's why like I'm so like into the book community and like the Twitter community and stuff, yeah. and talking to authors and talking to other readers because I just I just don't have that. Even like I sit there and try to talk to my wife about a book and she just rolls her eyes at me. So well, the one advantage of these days is it's all online. <laughs> Every gaming group in the world pretty much has moved online in the last year and a bit. So, yeah, there are always okay. one shop stuff. I'm going on online. I need, I need, I need to join one. I guess I, I need to find the time to do that. That's the other trick. I barely, yeah, I barely find the time to read. So trying to trying to set aside a couple of hours. <laughs> yeah, and there's a well-known phenomenon of like you know people having kids and then stopping gaming for a few years. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, but with, you know, multiple kids in the last two years so we've been on hiatus a lot yeah <laughs> i can imagine <laughs> but then so, you wait like you know six seven eight years and then they want to play yeah see so i i'm i'm i've kind of converted my daughter already into like being a reader so she's only 10 months old but okay, like every so time she's in her play area she's always grabbing books and thumbing through them and i'm like yeah. all right all right, I like this. I like this. So, <laughs> so I'm already, yeah. <laughs> so so I'm like, all right. So I'm going ahead and stacking her bookshelf and going, okay, this is the first series that we're going to go through. And you know, like I I I try to read to her as much as as much as possible. Granted, you know, some of the bigger books, it's really hard to get through them because you're only getting like two or three pages yeah. in you know in a session. But um, but it's but it's a lot of fun. So if if I can get her into that. See, then my wife, my wife is like, but she's gonna be in dance and all this other stuff. I'm like, can I just have like a nerdy daughter? Is it is that okay? <laughs> you know, read in between classes. <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, I'm we're already we're already doing fantasy, man. We're already talking about like we we read a series on glitter dragons. Oh, it's been amazing. <laughs> but um. So, so next question for you. So we we got we got into you know kind of how you got into writing. Um, clearly, you've been you've been doing it for a little while uh, in in the RPG sense, and then now with with a few published novels. But uh, tell me a little bit about your writing process. How has it changed kind of from the beginning? You know, when you started writing uh, for these tabletop RPGs, and maybe you know, ha have you used a lot of that knowledge in the way you you progress through a novel? I don't mean. The, th the the huge advantage of, sort of starting at a relatively young age doing it full time and also like you're working in a field where the pay 
was not great even by the standards of like you know novel writing and so forth is that you sort of like learn to abandon any idea of like oh i must have like you know the right conditions i must like you know like you know i can only write if i'm like you know at my desk and so forth and you just go ah need words now <laughs> so i'm pretty good at sort of like at writing under any conditions at, at, at anywhere um and also starting with role-playing games to lesser set with novels i've been pretty good at sort of like you know getting the structure of a book in my head before like even before i start like you know with role-playing writing for me there's very little sort of discovery of like oh what's gonna happen next i will like you know once i have a project and i thought about it for a day or two i'll have a fairly good idea of what should go into it um so basically the process is just like sort of sitting down knocking out x words a day and talking off um novels i'm finding harder because they don't have the same Sort of or not intuitive, but like you have sort of like lengthy experience with them. But uh, hopefully, I'm getting faster with each one. <laughs> but I say because you because you plot out all of your books, right? You don't or do you do you do you pants at all? I do. I, I do. But what, what I found I do is I can't. I find the very get the novel started until I sort of have the right feel for it. So the first bit is always like you know I write like you know ten or twenty thousand words, just trying to like find the voice of the characters and. I throw out some random ideas for story and so forth, and not really have a clue what's going on. And then once I've gotten that sort of initial sort of foundation layer do done, I can go back and sort of like, you know, go, okay, what, 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 was, what was I talking about? Who are these people? What am I babbling about? And then I'll write an outline, and I'll write, then I can like go in and write a couple more chapters, and then I'll stop again and go, okay, hang on. Where, where, where is this going? Does any of this make sense? So it's sort of like, you know, it's plotted, but not the whole. I, I, I can't yet anyway plot the whole thing out from start to finish, but I can plot like you know the next five chapters out with some little certainty and a rough idea of the next like you know twenty or so, and a vague inkling of the ending. <laughs> Just vaguely, <laughs> I kind of know how it ends. Maybe, possibly, we'll I, I know how it could end, I, I, <laughs> but um, so yeah. Uh, Again, I've got, but all my instincts are based on role playing games where you don't want to like you know lock down the ending because the, the, you want to incorporate freedom for the players. Mm -hmm. uh, so novels, I, I, I shouldn't be doing that, but I still am. So like, like you know, not locking down the characters until I have to. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious. You know, uh, a lot of authors I talk to say that their characters end up sometimes like doing things completely differently than they had originally plotted it out or whatever. Do you, do you feel like it comes easier to you considering you do? tabletop gaming stuff because I feel like you know, there's always these different uh, you know, directions that your characters can go in or your the players in your party can go in. You see, my, I, I suspect what I do, and I shouldn't be doing it, is because I'm used to running tabletop games where the players are the protagonists and as the game master, you're playing all the supporting cast. What I often, what I already is my supporting cast start running off to interesting things that they're going, no, no, no. You 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 like you you don't get to be the star of the scene. Back in your box, you're supposed to like you know, be a vague threat for one scene, and then go away again. Um, which is why I think I, the um, Black Iron Legacy books a, have such a large number of viewpoint characters, especially like you know, like small like you know, one or two chapter ones, and also why some of them are villains because like you know my villains are sort of pop, or my supporting cast are popping up going we, we we have our own ideas about how this is going to go. Yeah, and you know, I, I feel like it was really interesting. We'll, we can get into this a little bit more, um, you know, a little bit. But you know, the the opening chapter of the gutter prayer, when the chapter is from the point of view of a building, <laughs> it, it it's it's like the most interesting in, in, you know intro chapter I've ever read. But I absolutely loved it. Um, what do you and, have? And so, like, you know, you don't have many people writing chapters from the, the vantage point of buildings. So I feel like we need that. We need more of that. <laughs> yeah. Well, there, there, there's more of us in the books as well. But um, see, but that's over. Like, that chapter was written, it was pants. Like, I had no idea what I was doing. Like, why is this building right, like, right to me in the, in the second person where like, you, know, you were up there? Like, you, know, you see these people climbing up, climbing along your roof. They're like, what? As I'm typing it. <laughs> And then so sit down after I go, okay, right. Why was that happening? Why? And like you know, come up with an explanation as to the random stuff I typed out. Yeah. 
I gotcha. Um, so tell me who, uh, who are some of your, your writing influences or maybe, you know, some of, some of the, the authors that you read growing up that kind of were like, you know, influenced you to get into this type of thing? I mean, Tolkien sort of looms large over everything I do. Um, my mother introduced me to Lord of the Rings at a young and impressionable age. The first role play game I ever played was a Lord of the Rings game. Um, and I've done like lots of work in Middle Earth. And so Tolkien's like sort of very much the bedrock of you know, how I think of fantasy all the time. I, the Tolkien are sort of reacting against him. Um, I was a huge William Gibson fan, and like the gutter prayer books are like sort of fantasy cyberpunk in a lot of ways. Um, Robert Holstock, um, who isn't as well known, but did some fantastic weird fantasy set, like you know, sense of this is a porous boundary between our world and this fantasy realm in the Mythical Wood series. Um, who else? Lately, Jeff Vandermeer has been a huge sort of like you know, reference point. Uh, I keep pressing his. The two books I press on people are The Baby Owner's Manual and Wonder Book, which is his guide to writing fantasy. Um, and the possibly shouldn't be combined. <laughs> uh, who else? Um, I have a pretentious mention of Berto Echo because um, Foucault's Pendulum is one of my favorite, favorite books ever, and another book I sort of press on people, and they appreciate that even less. <laughs> Because, yeah, yeah I mean, it, it, my book starts with, like, you know, a building in the second person. Fuga's Pendulum, like, hits you with, like, your untranslated, um, untranslated, what do you call it, um, Aramaic in the opening chapter. Oh, gosh. <laughs> it's fantastic. But, yeah, you, you, for that book, you, you used to, like, you, you read the first, like, your know, five chapters, just, like, you know, hold out like this, going, I don't know what any of this is about. <laughs> Slipping pages. <laughs> yeah, this, 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 this is. This is I, yeah, I don't know. But then you flashback, and it's like twenty years ago, and everything gets explained. It's that's mainly jokes for the Templars for fifty for like five hundred pages. Oh, uh, gotcha. Yeah, you mentioned you mentioned Wonder Book. Yeah, I, I grabbed a copy of it, and um, Stephen King's on writing, and uh, I know Gareth Powell has one on writing. Yeah, and over there. Uh, Tim, uh, Tim Wagoner just released one not too long ago on writing as well. So I'm just, I'm like, I just keep grabbing all these books. And I know, is it MD Presley who has one on world building? And there's another one. Familiar. I think that he's written it's, it's two books that he's got. Yeah. But yeah, like I, I'm trying to like gather them all for when I finally catch up on my reading this year. <laughs> like maybe this summer, you know, I'm going to start reading some of the, some of the writing books. Cause I, I really want to sit down and start writing one of my own. Yeah. And uh, I just know absolutely nothing about craft. So <laughs> Here, I, I, I add uh, Robin D. Lowe's is beating the story. Beating the story. Okay. Yeah, not Robin's a friend of mine, but we, he, he, he thinks in a very, very different way about story than I do. He's very, very sort of clinical and organized. And like, you know, so the beating the story is about basically like your know, plot beats and how to like, you know, map out the story's emotional impact and so forth. Okay. And Go ahead and put that down. I, I, I couldn't write that way, but it's a very good to analyze what you've written. Okay. All right. I've got it. I've got a wish list now. So. <laughs> yeah, because you know, I, granted, I I'm not as well read as a lot of people in my circle, and they like to tell There's me that. All the books behind them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, these are for collectors' purposes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, they, <laughs> I, I literally get them and then shove them. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, I, I've only been reading for like really reading for about five or six years. I mean, I read a little bit in elementary school, a little bit in high school. You know, I read like Harry Potter when I was younger, and then um, I read a lot of Dean Koontz in high school because my dad was like, "You got to read this guy." <laughs> um, and then that kind of got me into, into King and so forth. But you know, I, I feel like I've read a lot of different authors, and I've. I kind of feel how they how they do their prose and you know how they do approach to world building and characters and stuff. So I'm like, okay, I, I I get it. Like I know what makes it good, but I feel like I I can't like I'm, when I when I think about writing dialogue, I'm like, no, I'm just gonna write I'm just gonna write the story and the characters are just kind of there. They don't talk at all. <laughs> <laughs> they they just they, they just see what's around them and they just keep moving on. It's well, kind of like uh, Peter Newman's uh, The Vagrant. You know, like he like he doesn't like talk at all. I, I, I really wish it was because yeah, I, I heard his character's completely mute. Mm -hmm. But I mean, 
one thing I found immensely reassuring, which I did last year, there's these books called the History of Middle Earth, which are basically they're the how Tolkien wrote Lord of the Rings, and basically they go through all the different um like you know versions of the text. So like you know, his first draft, because he wrote everything out in longhand and they kept the various drafts. So basically you got like you know, version one of chapter one, version two of chapter one, version three of chapter one. And the books go through all the differences. And last year I spent like three or four days going through all of them and I tweeted it all. But um it was nice to watch like you know, the story evolve and how he had no idea whatsoever what he was doing <laughs> at all. And it makes me feel a little bit better. <laughs> well, it, it's it's incredibly reassuring to the Tolkien who wrote like you know the single most influential fantasy book, the best selling us book in like you know history. He had no idea. It's like, and then some hobbits went on a walk, and and. And they met the guy I wrote a poem about, Tom Bombadil. That's the one bit of plot I have. They meet Tom Bombadil, and then I don't know. That's crazy. I, 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 I guess I need to go look into that because that, that's fascinating. Just the fact that maybe, maybe, maybe this is what I need to do. Because everybody tells you if you're going to write a book, just write. Just write, write, write until you're finished. Like, don't yeah. think about it and just write. Maybe this is what I need to do. I just need to, like, you know, bumble along on the page. Absolutely. And get, you know, Hundred thousand words deep, and go. Okay, should I read it or should I just go on to the next thing? <laughs> well, the, the great thing is, like you know, and what, what, what they don't tell us is, you can go back and change stuff, and yeah. all the clever bits come from when you go back and change stuff, like all the, like, you know, the brilliant plot twists and like you know, the clever foreshadowings. It's all set of hand. It's all added in later. Yeah, yeah. See, my thing is like I, my first like chapter has to be perfection. Is is my issue because I'll, I'll sit there, I'll sit there and write, and I go. I get this idea in my head and I throw it all out and I've got, I've got like a thousand words started on a story and I'm like, I love this. It's great. And I've gone back and I've edited it a few times and my wife's like, this sounds really good. I, have I touched it again? No, I haven't. <laughs> Cause I stopped. Like I just, I wrote it and then I just didn't do yeah. anything again with it. Um, so maybe, maybe it's just time I start back on it and I just go. And then he, he did some stuff and some yeah. other things and yeah. there was this other character and <laughs> yeah. sit, sit down, type, make words come. The, the words don't have to be good. You can make them good later on. Yeah, it's a, it's a hard lesson to learn because you feel like you, you you sort of if you sort of sit there and judge yourself or editing yourself as you're writing, you're you're more than likely to doom yourself and like stop yourself writing. You, you have to turn off that internal critic. For yeah, a while. yeah, yeah, and that and that's yeah. I think that's the hardest part that I'm I'm figuring out because I've yeah. started three or four different stories and I just go back and critique myself every single time and it I, makes me not want to write anymore and I go why is writing fun why do people why does anybody find this fun um, and yeah, yeah it's, it's just I, that I hate, perfectionist yeah I hate writers to find it fun <laughs> parts are fun but like you know as a whole. Yeah. But I, say, I guess it, I guess it could be fun when you know your characters take a turn you don't expect. But other than that, it's just kind of yeah. like, oh gosh, I'm gonna get two thousand words up today. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you feel like to they, they, be a puppeteer isn't like you. He walked up the street. He looked at the building. There, it was an interesting building. Insert building description here. Yeah. He felt <laughs> some appropriate emotion at this point. I don't. Know. Yeah. And the weird thing is, often you come back the next day and it'll actually be. Somehow it'll turn to good prose. They're going, I remember writing this and it was terrible. What, what happened? Yeah. Writing is basically like, you know, there's a description of um, reading of, as like, you know, staring at pieces of dead tree and hallucinating wildly. Yeah. And writing is even worse. Like, writing is like, you know, driving yourself into a series of like, you know, psychotic breakdowns <laughs> to entertain people you'll never meet. <laughs> that sounds about right. That sounds about right. Yeah. Uh, drink, I suspect. <laughs> so you're, you know, you're talking about Tolkien and how, you know, it just had just a bunch of what seems like ramblings that just yeah. kind of became cohesive in a story. You know, I was talking to somebody, uh, somebody the other day about how I never realized that Robert E. Howard was so young when he died, yeah. but yet wrote a massive amount of fiction uh, in, in those just few years that he was writing. Like he, as pe some people talk about, Oh, he's a writing machine. I'm like, Robert E. Howard was a writing machine. There, there, there are some people who, for whom writing is this, like, you know, necessary escape valve, or they go completely mad. Mm -hmm. um, Philip K. Dick is, is, is the one I always turn to. If you're, you've heard the show of Philip K. Dick's writing approach. Mm -mm. You are Philip K. Dick. 
you are a like you know young science fiction writer. You have a wife and child. You work out that if you write like you know twelve hours a day, you can earn X money. X is not enough to live on. If you work uh, sixteen hours a day, you will earn enough money. But you physically cannot work sixteen hours a day. If you work twenty two hours a day, you can afford both your child's both your like your family bills. And the amphetamine habit, that's right, 22 hours a day. <laughs> so you write and you write and you write and you write on like you know, many, many drugs. And then a clay pot breaks, shooting a laser beam into your eyes. And it's a laser beam that tells you that God is a space station and you're living in the Roman Empire because it's like the Matrix, only the Roman Empire never fell. And like, it's actually like, you know, 77 AD or something. And Nixon is Caesar. And then you write that down and sell that as a novel because you're full of creative and you're a mad genius. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. There, there, there are different degrees of being, being a healthy writer. <laughs> I try and stay on the, like, you know, not laser light version of it. <laughs> the not it, massive amount of amphetamines <laughs> and writing mm-hmm. 22 hours a day. Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe that's what it is. Maybe I don't have the drive because I've got a full time job and I don't need to write to, to make money. Maybe that's what it is. Maybe I'm going to tell my wife tomorrow. I'm going to quit my job and I'm just going to write. <laughs> and then they don't, they don't give me the motivation. I've been told it's a bad idea. I know that's like almost. <laughs> I didn't quit my job. The company shut down. I just didn't get another job. Yeah, I, I, you know, I've seen some people that you know have have quit their day jobs, become like freelance editors and stuff. And I just go, man, I just, I don't have, I, I don't, I can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, can, and I kind of like my job, so yeah. like, I'm, I'm like, yeah. But I mean, you can write in like you know, at, at any time in whatever like you know, amount you have, you can, like, you can afford. Like you, you don't need to. Do it full time to right. w- w- to write a book or to to, to start writing. Like, you know, you can start writing yeah. with five minute chunks. Yeah, uh, really, just question like sort of like sitting sitting down at a keyboard and tapping away. Um, yeah, yeah. I just you know I, I I can I can imagine like at some point you know you can become the the full time writer that you've quote unquote always wanted to be if, if that was your plan. But, you know, I know it does take a while. And I know there's some, there's some indie authors. I think there was an article the other day about Dakota Kraut where he made like $1.8 million in a year self-publishing, you know, lit RPG books. And I'm like, holy crap. You know? um, but, you know, th- th- those stories are so few and far between. But, I mean, it, it yeah. shows you that you can do it if you have the motivation to do yeah. it and you can and generate the sales. But um, Actually, um, Tim Clare, who does this writing podcast, was pointing out there that like, you know, the stories you hear are the ones that succeed. Mm-hmm. Like, it's, it's like the planes going off to like you know, over, on bombing raids over Germany like you know, the ones that make it back are the ones that weren't shot down yeah so if you, if you, if somebody tells you oh yes I, I, I quit my job and like you know wrote and now I make like you know, 1.5 million on like you know this RPG that's like you know, the one guy who succeeds versus all the other guys who didn't make it yeah all, all the other guys who sold like a book and <laughs> yeah yeah it's 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 crazy yeah yeah I, I, I can't imagine that. You know, I've never I've never been the one to grow up and be like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna become an established writer. You know, it's one of those things where like I feel like I, I could write a book, you know, if if I really put my mind to it and sat down to do it. And I'm like, I've got all the tools to do it. Like I've I've got my writing processor and everything. But I'm just like, just, just do it. No, no, <laughs> I'm like, I'd rather read. <laughs> Um, so let's, let's kind of, let's kind of dive in, into your books now. So, um, before we go on to the broken God, um, can you, yeah, up there, <laughs> can you do a little bit of maybe kind of like a gloss over the gutter prayer and the shadow saint, which are the first two books in the series? Oh. Okay. Dokie. Um, the books as a whole are called Black Iron Legacy. They are not, repeat, not a trilogy, despite, uh, scurrilous rumors online. Um, it's set in this sort of steampunk-esque, alchemy-esque punk um, fantasy setting, so it's like quasi-Victorian, um, in the city called Guerdon. Uh, in the setting, gods are real and active and dimensionist, but not really sentient, where there's sort of like, you know, sort of like living concepts, living spells, people refer to them as. And off beyond Guerdon, over the seas, there's this ongoing gods war as country, as like, you know, 
nations who worship these different pantheons are clashing and blowing each other and it's all horrible and nightmarish. But Guerdon is nice and safe and making lots of money by selling alchemical weapons to the various sides in the Gods War. And the gutter prayer is the tale of these three thieves, um, Carolyn Thay, Spar, and Rat, who's a Lovecraftian ghoul who's wandered into the story, and all the fun and shenanigans they have when uh, one of these gods starts contacting Carolyn and sending her visions and strange just arises. And it sort of starts off as a sort of like, you know, relatively low-key heist slash uh, Thieves Guild intrigue novel. And then as the book goes on, it escalates and more and more factions get involved and we sort of like, you know, explore the politics and the religion and um, sort of structures of the city as they respond to this sudden eruption of divine power on their streets. And that ends in a fairly cataclysmic miracle. And the Shadow Saint picks up about a year later. And we switch focus there from Carolyn to her cousin, Eldora, who was a sort of supporting character in the Gutter Prayer. And in the Shadow Saint, she's become involved in sort of the uh, government of the city and doing sort of like, um, uh, helping out with elections and advising various political figures. And she gets involved in an espionage plot as various belligerents in the Gods War start infiltrating their agents into Guerdon, um, going after these weapons which can kill gods, which we made by the, by the Alchemist Guild and then got lost in the in said giant explosive miracle. And by the end of the Shadow Saint, we're getting really into spoiler territory here, even though I'm trying to avoid giving away too much. Um, by the kind of saint, the city is occupied by three different groups. There's the uh, Empire of Hate, who are these like necromancers who are sort of uh, you know, the old empire rotting and decaying, but still holding on. There's Ishmir, who is the sort of expansionist power full of absolutely lunatic gods and religious fanatics and very powerful magically. And there's the Girdana, where Basically, the Mafia, only instead of the Godfather, there's dragons at the top of each family. And Book 3, The Broken God, is mainly about the Girdana. You've got them occupying part of Guerdon and trying to expand their influence there and all the shenanigans that happen as they uh, go about trying to take over the, the alchemy trade and extend their power. And meanwhile, Carolyn has gone off on this fantasy epic quest looking for this lost city of Kabesh. And on the way, she runs into this whole island, which is another island taken over by the Girdana. And because she, uh, when she was like powerful and magical back in Guerdon, uh, basically really, really screwed up their plans and killed lots of them and kicked them out of the city. And now they're back and they also want revenge on her. And she's lost all her power and magical influence. She has to basically navigate this island where Prut, everyone is trying to kill her. And that's the broken god. Okay. <laughs> so, um, first of all, uh, I have to give you applause for using the word shenanigans. I always love when people can can put in shenanigans in any type of sentence. Uh, it's 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 a very underused word, and I feel like it should no, be not, not around here. <laughs> but I can imagine with three kids, shenanigans is used pretty often. No, I, I went to Ireland. It's it's it's, it's not. It's, but oh, it's going to be common. <laughs> Maybe it's just not used much in the South here in the, in the States. That's so probably possible. That's, that's what it is. <laughs> Gravy and biscuits, which is just like... You know. <laughs> I, I, feel like I feel like the only reason we know the word shenanigans is thanks to the movie Super Troopers. I don't know if you're familiar with that movie at all. But uh, Super Troopers, it's a... Uh, it's, it's a comedy with... Uh, it's about state troopers, but they're like all very quirky. Yeah, they never saw it, but you... I, I, I've scrolled past it on Netflix. <laughs> You, if, if you ever just get a couple of hours to yourself, I would suggest not bringing the kids in, but watch it. It's it's, okay. it's a good time. It's like a cult classic if you want to call yeah. it that. Um, but uh, so so tell me, I want to I want to know a little bit uh, kind of behind the scenes of so I, so I always I, I've always pronounced it as Gurdon because of uh, John Banks' narration. Um, but uh, a little bit you know kind of kind of where 
where the, uh, you know, where you got your ideas behind the city. Um, and then, you know, your three main characters, uh, which, which rats probably my favorite, um, you know, behind, behind, behind Carolyn, of course, mm -hmm. but, um, but, you know, just tell me about your inspirations behind it, kind of where you draw, you know, you drew your influences. I mean, the um, city is, um, like physically it's like, you know, or, or sorry, architecturally it's like London and Edinburgh. Cause I, I, I Edinburgh, have, if you've been there, is this like fantastic, so like, you know, multi multi-layered multi-level city where like it's all built on hilltops and, and with like you know, fairly steep valleys you have bridges going over things that's all this lovely like you know, 18th century architecture and sort of smoky and steamy and steampunky whereas the layout of garden and a lot of the her districts are based on cork where i live like we um so like there are like lots of locations which are like you know if, we, like, if I look out, I've seen like, you know, like three or four pharmaceutical plants at my window. And that's where the alchemists came from. And like, you know, parts of the wash are based on like, you know, alleys I know up in the north side of Cork. And the university is the university where I went to college and so forth, just sort of transplanted in and also like, you know, warped and exaggerated. And then a lot of it's just layering on history. Um, I read a lot of history books and like this idea of like, you know, how cities evolve over time. Like they're, that like, they, you sort of like dig through them and they're, they, they're the different eras of the city and it's not like so the, the past year gets washed away and you see the top of it. Well, that does happen. Like, you know, like, you know parts of Paris, for example, where Baron Huppen just like, you know, bulldoze the place. But anyway, in most cities, like, buildings change purpose. Things that, built onto, they get extended, they get demolished, partly demolished, they get reused. I still think there's that sort of war lived in feeling to an old city. <laughs> and we evoke that in, in, in fiction and, I, and then sort of like, you know, have creatures that have been around since the start of the city and these like, sort of like, you know, old magics and old powers lingering in the bricks. Yeah. Um, I got anyway, Yeah. Also, I just really like writing about big buildings and weird architecture. Go on with that, <laughs> another huge influence. Okay, so yeah, because you know, you, you clearly have this this old city feel, uh, especially like in the underground and in the tunnels and so forth. Um, because you have, you know, these, I guess you could almost like call them old gods, yeah. uh, kind of living beneath the city. Uh, and then you know, as you get to the Shadow Saint, uh, you know, you kind of see it it shift a little bit. But you know, I, I feel like you know, Gurdon, and I'm and I'm sure you you meant it this way, but it just feels like it's very alive, you know, in the pages, uh, you know, as you're reading. So you're not only reading about these characters and their lives, but, you know, the city is actually breathing, you know, itself, uh, which you always hear that, you know, in, in most major towns, but like, it actually feels like the buildings are moving. <laughs> Plus as well, like, you know, I find, find that the, when, when, I, when I think back about, like, your know, books that I read that sort of linger with me, often it's less the characters in the story and more just the places. Mm -hmm. Like, I would just go back, like, to sort of loop back to Tolkien yet again. Like, Tolkien, you, we often discuss like you know, the locations like the old forest or Moria or Minas Tirith or Mortar as much as the characters. Um, because I think if you sort of paint the big enough canvas, like you know, you can imagine other stories, and other events happening in the same places, and it's, it, it feels very. Or I don't like. I don't like find stories where basically you feel like you know, okay, that's done. Like you know, one story, one possible story could have happened here, and it's happened. And it's done. Mm -hmm. I like play, I like for possibly the gaming, back, gaming background. I like just like you know, like you know, settings where you could you could conceivably have multiple stories and where just because this one story is finished doesn't mean the setting is all the juices being used up. Yeah, yeah, because you know I feel like there's there's just so much left to unpack from before all you know all the happenings and the gunner prayer. Um, you know, I mean, clearly you've you've still got you know, this whole underground to, to kind of to see through and so forth. And, you know, you've already spoken about how this isn't a trilogy and it's, you know, you're, you're planning on, you're yeah. planning on more books in the exactly. series. Um, but, you know, it, would it be something that you would, we would try to like maybe come back to at some point to write like something that happened beforehand uh, to kind of how we got up to the point we are now? Possibly. Although okay, in all the books there, there's like, you know, more, more secrets to uncover from the past. Like, you know, in The Broken God, there's, it's not a major plot element, but there are, there's like bits where they were exploring the past of the city and they're talking about like, you know, 
stuff that happened three or four generations ago and how that still has impacts. Um, I don't. If I, I have like sort of thrown idea around, around the idea of prequels, especially as the one character that everyone loves in the Gutter Prayer, Saint Lena, uh, isn't around very much in the, in the later books. And I, if, if I was being sort of like you're nakedly commercial to be like, oh, Saint Lena prequel. <laughs> Yeah, you know, because you know, like you were saying, you know, you've kind of built it to where there could be other stories uh, mm -hmm. in the same area. You know, you could you could have a you know almost even like a parallel story that maybe takes place in a, in another city, yeah. uh, and that kind of hints towards the happenings in Gurdon, you know, and how it kind of affects that city, which you know kind of is what happened. You know, I guess you could say in Lord of the Rings with all these kind of exterior books that have come out yeah. post. Um, but yeah. Uh, Tell me a little bit about about maybe you know about the creation of of your characters. You know what, what were your inspirations behind you know Carolyn and and Rat and Spar uh, and kind of what made them stand out to be you know kind of those main focal points in the first book. I know they took a little bit of a backseat in the second yeah. book. I'm just you know clearly they're going to be coming back in the third yeah. book. <laughs> well, um, Carolyn, I sort of came up with the character basically when I tried writing novels before. I found I was writing, because I had so much experience doing tabletop games, I found I was writing stories that didn't have protagonists. That basically I would be very good at setting up like, you know, the setting and the supporting cast and the, the sort of initial plot. And then my main hero would sort of go, right, what do you do? But because there's no player there to animate it, so they're going, oh, they just sort of stand there and do nothing because like, you know, I'm expecting a player to, to pipe up. So Carrie was sort of created as a character who would take on that role by leaping at whatever happens to her. She's like extremely reactive and like, will, like, you know, will never stand still. If something happens, she'll either like, you know, run towards the explosion or away from the explosion, but she will not. She, she will always react in a fairly violent and stabby fashion normally. <laughs> um, so then I had this protagonist who would basically give, uh, sort of like a coil spring who would drive the story. And Spar who's the, the, the son of the, of the former leader of the Thieves Guild and is suffering this, this disease that's turning into stone. Uh, part of him just came from wanting a foil to carry who, as someone who would be more sort of like, you know, thoughtful and considered and would like, you know, go through the various options and basically be sort of a counterweight to her. And also at the time I was writing, I'd like blown a disc in my back. So I was having like, you know, like, you know wasn't a lot of trouble in pain moving. So I just like put a lot of that into the book and... <laughs> Uh, gave him this, like, you know, lethal disease, which is not what I had, fortunately. Um, and then Rat was like, you know, as I said, the, the ghouls there are straight lift from uh, Lovecraft, but sort of twist, then sort of twisted a bit. And that was just a, a, a great chance to have a character who was a, you know, a, a, a viewpoint character tag that you, you get inside his head but he does not think or appreciate stuff like a human does at all. And part of that was an exercise in like, you know, seeing how sympathetic and comprehensible you could make a very, very non-human character. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah, you, the entire time you were talking about Spar, all I could think was that he was Carillon's rock because he's a stone man. <laughs> there are far too many stone puns in those books. <laughs> They really are. <laughs> so, um, you know, like you said, this isn't going to be a trilogy. Um, you know, how many books do you have currently planned for the series? Um, I mean, I know clearly it kind of yeah. it, it it's pushed as a trilogy right now because that's, well, that's it, what it, the books we know of. We really pushed, but like you know, people assume very reasonably that like you know three books equals a fantasy series, right? <laughs> For which, for which we can blame not Tolkien, but paper prices in post-war England, because <laughs> they have to split up Lord of the Rings. Anyway, um, yeah, my current uh, my current plan is to do five books, and uh, that basically the first the first four will be all take between Carrie and Eldora as the main viewpoint characters. So, you see, book four will be Eldora, and then book five is the grand finale. Everyone comes together. Um, that's it. As I said, we said that there's scope from war in the setting, so either spin offs or prequels, sequels, or interstitial, interstitial books could fit in in the middle there. Um, okay. Yeah. Such as the plan. Gotcha. But, you know, 
publishing is <laughs> as established as a, a strange and chaotic environment. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah, especially you know with pandemic and you know yeah, all that exactly. kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, I recommend not having your book two come out just at, just just before the pandemic starts. <laughs> I know, right? I you know, know. or or it could just be like a lot of people I spoke to last year they had their debut come out right at the beginning of it. You know, uh, yeah, that was rough. Yeah, um, but uh, so tell me, uh, what are you what are you working on now? Um, I know uh, you've got. You know, speaking of Tolkien, you've got yeah. some Lord of the Rings stuff going on right now. But uh, can you tell tell everybody a little bit about what you're working on right now? Right, right now, um, for one publisher, for Free League, I'm doing um, supplements for their new uh, One Ring role game, which is the t licensed Lord of the Rings game. Um, I've been working on Maria for them for many, many years at this point. Um, the project has gone through an awful lot of internal changes and so forth, but it's going to be a sleep, you know, your guide to the Lost City of the Dwarves and expeditions to get it to um, find the treasures they're in. Um, but before that comes out, because that's been like back burner yet again, I've written a large chunk of the uh, Eriador supplement, which is basically uh, the Lost Kingdom of Arnor, which is like the North Kingdom of the Dunedain, and basically trying to there's trying to fill up like you know details on the North. So there's like you know, stuff on Tharbad, which is this. Um, by the time of the Rings, it's this ruined city, but the role playing game is set about like 50 years before Lord of the Rings. So basically you're playing in the era where like, you know, Aragorn's off on his errand trees before he becomes the chief of the Dunedain. And Bilbo has come back from a strip the Lonely Mountain, Smog is dead, but Frodo is still like, you know, a young kid or newly born at this point, or just, because just about born, exactly that dates. But basically, you're playing with the, the, the slow build up towards the War of the Ring. Like, you know, Sauron is back in Mordor and Mount Doom has arisen as spoken again. But the the like the full force of the war is yet to begin. Um, so, um, yeah, I've been working on the North uh, North Kingdom supplement for that, which has been fun to sort of, like, you know, fill in little gaps in Tolkien and like, you know, find little places where you can sneak in stories. <laughs> As I can imagine, there's plenty of places to stick in stories. <laughs> Think about Tolkien. It's like being in. It was like to be, to, like, you know, to be invited to like you know, go and play in this lovely museum of Venetian glass or something. Like, you can do whatever you want, but you have to be very, very careful. Very, very quiet. Very <laughs> Don't touch anything. You can, you can touch things, but just the, just the right way. <laughs> It's very, very hard to add stuff to Middle Earth and have this. Yeah. Because Tolkien has, for example, it's an absolute genius with names because he was like a philologist. He like you know, he studied names and words professionally for like you know many, many years before he started before he wrote Lord of the Rings. And every name in Lord of the Rings pretty much has some like you know, deep meaning or you can sort of trace the route back to like you know like your old English words or something. So when you're trying to add stuff, you're trying to like you know replicate that feel as much as you can. Mm -hmm. And like, I got, I've spent like you know, whole days like you're know, typing a name, deleting it, typing a different name, deleting it, going off through like your know, Sindar dictionaries and old English books and <laughs> trying to find the like, right term, or going back through Tolkien's other writings and trying to like you know, find something I can like you know, borrow and twist. Yeah, it's very, it, it's very, very different. So sort of, like, the experience of sort of sitting down and like you know, creating something ex nihilio, you have to like, you know, you sort of cultivate and sort of curate everything. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one thing. Another thing I'm doing, which is far more relaxing in some ways, is um, I'm doing an adventure for Thirteenth Age. Thirteenth Age is this like D and D esque uh, role playing game, like high fantasy stuff. And for the last while, I've been working on this thing called Prophet of the Pyre, which is this like you know, epic level or epic ten level campaign. Um, we start off as like you know, sort of like you know, farm boys and like you know. Uh, Starting off adventures, and over the course of the campaign, you will rise to to challenge the gods and like you know the full uh, epic scope of, of fantasy series in, in one book. Although at this point, we one very very large book as the world is increasing. Um, the other main things I'm working at the moment, um, coming out at some point soonish, I hope, is the Burlesque Connection, which is a campaign for the Fold of Green role playing game. 
Full of Green is the 1960s Spies vs. Cthulhu game. And the Burlesque Connection is this world hopping campaign based around the heroin trail. So you start off in like the jungles of Southeast Asia, and you go to Turkey, you go to um, various in Europe, you go to Marseille, following this like, you know, international heroin trafficking slash <laughs> mythos cult investigation. <laughs> Interesting. It's fantastic. Uh, to write, although, as as usual, for any right, like you know, your your Google history becomes this like you know, please don't arrest me. Yes, I just spent the last day learning how to make heroin, but it was for a good cause, I swear. <laughs> it was for a book. It was for a book. <laughs> yeah, just like you know, how, how does how does you know a body look after being beaten with X object? <laughs> so, um, someone undetectably. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so how about uh, how about in the in the broader publishing world? Do you have uh, do you have any new series you're working on? Yes, ish, and it hasn't been announced yet, and I'm not supposed to talk about it. But uh, I, I, there I, there is a non Black Iron Legacy thing in the works, um, which will hopefully be announced before too long. Or well, they'll, they'll wait until the initial flood of publicity for the Broken God has gone away before announcing it. Yeah, but yeah, that is due end of the year for the first book on that. So, uh, need to get going on that. Awesome. Um, it's a, yeah, it's a bit more, it's less aggressively in your face weird than <laughs> the Black Iron Legacy books. Um, but I'm, that's more so like you're know, lulling the reader to a false sense of like your know, security, of security and normality. <laughs> I had to say, you know, I remember, I remember, I think I saw, Either it was either Peter McLean's blurb uh, when the gutter prayer was first announced. I can't remember exactly what it was, but you know, everybody kept saying it was it was weird fantasy. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, I wonder what they're really talking about. And then you read it and you're like, that was a bit odd. It was good, it was odd. <laughs> and so so I guess, I guess it's time for some straight laced fantasy. <laughs> a little bit. It's got elves in it. And they're called elves. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> They don't have some kind of odd name. <laughs> I got you. Well, cool. We'll definitely look forward to that. Well, Gareth, yeah. um, I appreciate you taking the time to come chat today. Uh, clearly, we're excited about The Broken God coming out on May 18th. Um, and for everybody that's watching, if you haven't checked out The Gutter Prayer or The Shadow Saint, make sure you read them in order. Gutter Prayer, Shadow Saint, <laughs> then Broken God when it comes out on May 18th. Uh, but definitely check them out. I think they do actually put numbers on them somewhere. Yes, they do. See, they have numbers. <laughs> That's your clue. There you go. Uh, but definitely go check those out. Um, Gareth, we'll look forward to uh, to your new series as well coming out. Uh, hopefully we can get uh, the fourth and fifth books in the Black Iron Legacy. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and everybody check out The One Ring as well when it comes out. I, I know I've been seeing – I saw the, the campaign on Kickstarter for it. It looked really amazing. Yeah, they so. earned like, you know, a million plus because yeah. – Crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, best of luck uh, on the uh, the campaign trail towards uh, Pub Day, and uh, we'll we'll definitely be uh, talking again soon. Cool. Thanks so much. Awesome. Have a good one.